I'm so delighted to introduce you to Dr. Melanie Wong on the Ageless by Rescue podcast. It's always a pleasure and delight to have the very top experts in a particular field. And the field of immunology and allergies is, is you know, one of the most um, uh, areas of, top, uh, of topical importance in a post-pandemic world. Uh, Dr. Wong, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Dr. Wong, your qualifications and background and the advisory boards that you serve on are manifold. I'd love you to share with our audience just some of the things that you're involved with in this area of expertise. So I think I'll just briefly say that I'm a paediatric allergist and immunologist. Um, I have a passion as far as developing uh, in, and expanding our treatments and diagnostic abilities for people with immunodeficiencies, particularly children, but also adults, and also for people with allergies and, and autoimmunity and, and other disorders of, of the immune system. Um, as part of what I've been doing, I've been a past president of uh, at the as ASCIA, which is the Australasian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergy. And I'm on a number of, of strategies, including the National Immunodeficiency Strategy and also the National Allergy uh, Council, both of which are, are very, sorry, I'll start that again. Um, can I start that? So, but, but both, both of which are, um, are aimed at advancing the, the community awareness actually of these, these disorders and also trying to uh, increase funding for, for some of these areas. Um, one of the, you know, as a parent, um, the first time you become a, a, I guess, unless you have an autoimmune or allergy or immunology issues, the first time you become hypersensitive to um, these areas and these issues are during pregnancy or, you know, when you first send your children to school and you start becoming very aware of other children who may suffer from allergies or immunology issues. Um, and of course, you know, we were saying before in a post pandemic world, immunity has become such a buzzword where we're so aware of our immune function and, and um, the, the topic of discussion has become huge. Um, one of the things that I was really interested in the research and the uh, press release that I got from, from your organization was that there really is an opportunity to catch, test, and then modify treatment protocols if you test and um, understand any immuno uh, susceptibility or allergies early on. I'm interested to hear from you, what are some of the things that we can do now you know, uh, in utero or um, in early infancy that could really help uh, doctors and, and families um, treat and plan better? So this is a very broad area. I'll, I'll first of all, just per per perhaps talk about what was involved in this press release. And that that is actually directed at establishing newborn screening. So this is the Guthrie card that people uh, probably be recognized as, as blood taken from the heel or heel prick of uh, babies at about the second or third day of life. And that screens for a number of very important disorders in babies where the children usually look pretty normal in the first few months of life and then have developed potential complications from disorders that could be preventable if that diagnosis was made early and treatment was started early. So from the point of, and, and many of those are metabolic disorders and people will, will know of things like cystic fibrosis um, and hypothyroidism. From the point of view of immunodeficiency, this is uh, specifically one of the rarer types of immunodeficiencies and I'll get, I can talk about other things in a minute, but, but this is one very specific problem called severe combined immunodeficiency, which is SCID for short. And people might recognise that because of a number of um, a, a number of movies and and papers and, and that have been written about the Bubble Boy, which who was a, a boy by the name of David Better. That's right. I mean, it really captured everyone's imagination. I think it was about twenty years ago, right? That's exactly right. So this boy unfortunately had one of these genetic conditions that caused skid, and in this condition, 
the immune system is very much at, um, deficient such that over time, the babies end up getting infection after infection after infection from about the age of two to four months of life. And if definitely, if not recognized, uh, die very early in their life. And even if it's recognized and treated and they don't have a definitive treatment, which might well be bone marrow transplantation or gene therapy or other therapies as, as we can develop those over time, these children will usually die before the age of two and you start by thinking they were completely normal when they were born and if we can actually recognize that disorder before they got sick start the treatment and prevent them from getting sick then at the end of the day we we end up having a completely normal child then adult who hopefully has a completely norm, normal lifespan and as opposed to someone who might pass away before the age of two with with a horrific course in, in um, often in hospitals so so a big difference depending on what we do the the point that you uh, raise is is really important because you're saying that this test is already available in hospitals so um, so I understand that you know uh, all children that are born in Australia let's say are already having the Guthrie test the uh, the pre test and are you saying that there are other tests that could be added to this that could help our understanding or that this test by itself is enough to pick up on um, any of the these more severe uh, immunology issues or autoimmune di diseases so so this is just just to clarify the Guthrie test or the newborn screening test is the ability to collect the blood in in that first couple of days of life and then you can potentially look for a number of conditions and our issue is that the number of conditions that you can look for is limited often by cost and, and logistic issues and particularly for the newborn screening for SCID this is something that we are looking at adding as a routinely available test and so across the world uh, for example if you're born in America every state in America actually has added newborn screening for SCID to their programs. And we, we haven't. Have, we have not. Oh, and I will come back to that. If you were born in New Zealand, the same thing happens. So, for example, one child fairly recently who had been diagnosed with SCID in Australia, had um, the, the family had come from America and were in Australia for other uh, and I'm not going to go into the details, but we're in Australia where this child, when this child was born. And that child's mother had said well look if we'd been if he'd been born in America we would have had it picked up but being born in Australia there was a delay and obviously a lot more complications than otherwise might have occurred um, so there is disparity there and and lack of fairness and, and there are many countries in the world that are now adding progressively this ability to screen uh, to their newborn screening program in Australia and New South Wales we've had a a pilot program going on for the last four, almost four years now, and picked up a number of children with SCID. In the other states of Australia, this pilot, this program has not yet had the ability to start. And again, we're highlighting the fact that we've now got a discrepancy between uh, access to a, a very important test so that if you were born in the ACT in New South Wales, where we have the screening process available, you can have SCID diagnosed early. If you were born in the other states, unfortunately, unless you had what we call a family history, in other words, another child who had been affected in this family to suggest that you had a genetic predisposition to SCID, such that you could have tests done as soon as you were born, you will not be picked up until you get sick. I, I have a question for you. We're talking about a very specific uh, immunology issue here with SCID, but what about other allergies and other things that, uh, you know, are plaguing Australians. You know, we talk about uh, food allergies, which uh, seem to have multiplied um, skin disorders um, that seem to be on the rise, anaphylactic responses that, uh, you know, when I was growing up, it seemed to be far less uh, or far less discussed. Um, than what it is now. And th there seems to be an enormous amount of awareness, but 
a limitation to the testing that you can have, limitation to the number of experts, you know, to get on a, a, a wait list for an immunologist, a pediatric immunologist, a pediatric allergy test um, for a child is often over a year in New South Wales. Uh, I know because I've been down that path before for my child. And so what happens, you know, if, if we can't get the, that kind of testing for children, after that they after they're born and we're seeing occurrences of these serious um, illnesses in adults as well what are the testing protocols what can we ask for in the current medical system that could really add to the quality of life that could enhance health span lifespan longevity um, so again, I'll just clarify that that newborn screening test that we've just been talking about is very, very specific to. I understand under that part. I understand. So I want to talk, you know, we that's, I guess, a, a narrow issue for someone who's listening um, to this podcast. I want to also ask you, since we've got the opportunity to speak to an expert, is what happens for all the other screenings? What what are the options and why are there such delays and what can be done uh, in that within that reality? So, so separate for, from that newborn screening program that I've been talking about, which is very specific for a very rare condition, um, the disorders that you've been talking about, and we'll, we'll put this under the umbrella of immune dysregulation, so where the immune system is not doing its appropriate job and getting a little bit mixed up. And as such, it's showing itself up to be uh, in, in the form of allergy, in, in skin problems, um, autoimmunity, and what we call autoinflammation. So people having fevers, mouth ulcers, joint aches and pains, all those sorts of things where there's an inflammatory element to their disease. And you are very right. We are actually seeing more and more of these immune dysregulation disorders than we had many years ago, particularly, for example, if I compare when I first started started to work, we really didn't see quite as many. And, um, and it's not just because we are identifying or talking about it more, it does seem like there are more in the community. And it's quite complex to talk about why that might be this, the case. And lifestyle uh, and lifestyle issues may well contribute to our, um, our increasing rate of these disorders. Mm -hmm. So if we came back to your original question of, uh, of how we might be able to screen and diagnose children and, and adults earlier, it, it really does depend on what you've come with. So if we talk about allergy, for example, you're very right that, that it is actually very hard to access um, our, specialist allergists and immunologists but at the same time we're very we're trying very hard to upskill other people in the community including GPs and general pediatricians and physicians in, in order that they can help with the screening and management of the more straightforward conditions and so hopefully that will alleviate some of the issues that people face. At the same time we need to uh, educate the, the public in, to identify what is a severe allergy versus something that is an intolerance, for example, in, and, and in, in that process, trying to, to delineate what is potentially a dangerous thing. So we think about something called anaphylaxis, which is a very the extreme form of, a, of an allergic reaction where people could potentially, and I, and I do say potentially, die if they're exposed to even a very small amount of something, a food, for example, that or an antibiotic that they are allergic to. On the other hand, you can have an allergy which only gives you a bit of a rash or only gives you a bit of an itchy nose, for example. And, and so we know that, for example, people, a lot of people have hay fever. And many times the hay fever, once it's recognized, can be treated with fairly simple medications and not necessarily go down the, the route of, of uh, doing lots of expensive allergy tests, um, which may or may not help in the longer term, and I will come back. But if you recognize that you have hay fever and you treat your hay fever with antihistamines or nasal sprays and alleviate your symptoms, that can improve your lifestyle substantially. For example, it gets rid of the snotty nose, the constant sniffing and sneezing and, and, and coughing that in this day of COVID, every time you do that, everyone turns around and you have to say, sure do. <laughs> allergy. Yeah. Um, sleeping, 
and and if you don't sleep well you don't concentrate well and school and and work then is a bit of a chore because of all of those things and so if we can fix um, the symptoms of of allergic rhinitis then that can improve the lifestyle significantly but then, i want to ask you a question going back to something you raised which is inflammation um and you know in all of the um interviews that I've done with specialist experts uh, in regenerative medicine, in, uh, in wellness, the doctors always come back to inflammation is the main cause of cellular degeneration. And so um, immunology issues are often peak inflammation in incidences. Um, and so I want to ask you, in adult years, um, is genetic testing of of use, um, uh, could that be an additional thing that isn't necessarily held by specialists that, you know, a normal person can go and have some genetic testing to get more uh, insight and profile into their genetic disposition for some of these events and then use that with, you know, their GP if they can't get in to see an immunologist for a year to help read and understand what their genetic disposition is to some of these issues? So, so genetic testing is an incredibly complex area and it, it's limited in many respects by what, um, what the ability to analyze the genetic material that we have. So we have over 20,000 genes in our body. Not all of them are actually important to cause disease or not, depending on, on what mistakes there are. And in fact, the very, difference between you and I, different hair colour, different eye colour, etc., is all to do with mild differences in genes, which are obviously not, not going to hurt you. And so we all have potentially genetic mistakes that might hurt us, particularly if we happen to have, and we have one gene, one, one gene, a copy of the gene from a mum and our one other copy from, from dad. And for most diseases, if you have one that's not working and one that is, there is actually a bit of compensation, so you may not get illness. For other diseases, if you have one copy of the abnormal gene, there is not enough compensation by, with the normal one so that you will get illness anyway. And there are other groups of, of dis genetic disorders where you inherit it from on the X chromosome. So you get it only from the mum and there's no compensatory chromosome from the dad to help. And I highlight this because um, for those sorts of genetic diseases, which we call monogenic diseases, you can actually potentially find a genetic mistake. And with, with uh, computer technologies and a lot of uh, looking at the, uh, sorry, experience, looking at databases and, and looking at the literature, work out but, but because of various features that these are what we call pathogenic. And they can then highlight that you have a particular disease or not, or you might be what we call a carrier of a particular disease or not. And in a sense, this is actually now a fairly small group of, of clearly, of hopefully more defined issues. But at the same time, there's a big, big, big population of people who have diseases that might look like some of these, what we call monogenic diseases. And when we go and look for genetic causes, we're somewhat disappointed because we don't find it. And in a sense, if you think about the numbers, if I have someone that I really, really think has a particular monogenic disease, and I do a genetic test of a whole lot of genes trying to find the, the cause, we probably only find the cause in about 40 to 50%, which means that even if we have a, what we call a really high pretest probability of, of it being genetic, primarily genetic, half of the people actually haven't got something that we can find. And the importance though of finding the ones that we can find is that it can sometimes give us pathways for which to direct our treatments, to give the right treatments. That's um, exactly right. And not waste time. Now, the reason I'm bringing it up in that way is that for the other people, many, many, many more people who have similar symptoms, don't actually have a monogenic cause, sometimes we can use the fact that they have similar test results or similar presentations 
to someone who has a genetic disorder that we can totally understand their pathway or try to totally understand their pathways for to actually direct some of our treatments as well. So our research, our, uh, our progress in, in, in identifying genetic causes of disease is actually helping other people as well, even if what they possibly have is, is not genetic, yes. Well, maybe not not genetic, but not monogenic. In other words, not one gene causing their illness. What what could be contributing to people? And we have, and so I'll say that in many families, you can see this this family history of lots of similar disorders, and you think there must be a genetic component, but we don't find one gene. And what's often happening is that there are doses of different other genes that are contributing to the way we come across in an immune way, as opposed to other things, which might just make us a little bit more likely to get infection or a little bit more likely to get inflammation or a little bit more likely to get allergies. And you add a few of those genes together and you get not, ne not necessarily one of these monogenic disorders, but something that looks like it and which may actually respond to treatment like, like them. So um, taking that, um into account, um, you're saying that, you know, the work that is available in the body of evidence and research that's available from genetic testing can help inform and narrow the field of treatment protocols. Um, is that correct? That is, except that that's in general. And so if I come back to your very original question, can an individual just do a, a genetic test without um, very particular uh, reason to do so and as someone to actually look at the results and interpret it properly the usefulness in this point in time is not useful for that individual it may be useful when we take it all into um, in, in association with with populations and how we as doctors think about treatment but at this point in time there is no magic genetic test for the majority of people that they and can it take comes to immunology and uh, immune related diseases. So uh, we can do it for infants for very specific diseases. Um, you're saying that that could be helpful. And then in adults, um, we go back to the fact that they need to see if, if they are, you know, if we as adults are experiencing, uh, um, in, you know, chronic inflammation or uh, immunity related issues, you need to go to see an immunologist or an allergist for the appropriate testing and diagnosis. Is that correct? That's right. And that may in the end involve genetic testing because if those specialists think that this is likely to be a genetic, primarily caused by a genetic problem, then they might actually order the genetic testing that but that can help. So, so in other, other words, the testing is use, most useful if you if it's targeted. It's not as useful if you just include it in a thousand other tests to, and then try to make something of it. Now, um, so in adults, so uh, although in pediatrics, so in children, they are who present very early with significant illnesses there might be more of a genetic primary genetic component we can see that these issues in adults as well so it's not that adults do not have genetic disorders that of course that I, I sometimes it's because the diagnosis has been missed and so there are for example uh, people with what's called common variable immunodeficiency so cvid and that's probably as a group the most common uh, cause of of significant immunodeficiency, that's, that's what we call primary, in, in adults. And so it's likely that there is a genetic contribution, whether it's from one gene or a lot of uh, multiple genes to this happening. But in a way of trying to describe it, it's almost as if the immune system run out of steam. So it's okay when you're little, and then as you get older, there's more and more infections. And often when they're little and things are just starting, the tests can be actually fairly normal. And then when they're retested, when they're, when they're older, there's this classic abnormality where there's not enough antibody, which is one of the parts of our immune system that helps fight infection or some of the white blood cells. And it's laid down as air and you say, well, this is CVID. But when they were tested earlier, it wasn't, it wasn't able to be detected. And so there can be a delay. And in that, in that time, 
there can be scarring of the lungs, scarring of the ears, other, um, other influences on the gut and, and, and things like that, which can actually make it make life much harder and it might be harder to in, undo, particularly, particularly if there is scarring of the lungs. And so in adults, there is still the potential that there's a genetic cause. There's potentially more likely to be a genetic cause in kids. So we shouldn't stop looking if that's what's likely to be. And in terms of inflammation and uh, autoimmune diseases, um, and and I guess, you know, we've talked about uh, health span, but also lifespan, uh, what can we do, uh, you know, other than the normal uh, advice for a healthier lifestyle and wellness and testing? What can we do in a world where it is hard to get adequately diagnosed? It is difficult to see an expert, um, uh, you know, when you start first, when you first start seeing these, you might have to wait a year before um, you even get to see an expert. Are there things that you would recommend that are lifestyle changes that would be worthwhile exploring? Okay. So first of all, I'm going to say at the beginning, it's really important to go and see your general practitioner. And I know it is still harder to get in these days, mm. harder to get in to see your GP. But GPs actually are, are, are the triaging system and they very quickly often are able to pick up someone who actually needs to be escalated further. And even if it takes longer to actually physically see the specialist, the GP can actually do some tests to start off with. And what we know is that, for example, in this more common CBID entity um, or, or a number of other immunodeficiencies, in fact, if you just do a full blood count and look at the immunoglobulins, so IgG, IgA and IgM, so two very simple, commonly, you know, really easily available test, it picks up about 70% of people with CVID, um, or sorry, with immuno, primary immunodeficiency. So it is a very good screen. It doesn't mean if it's normal that there is no immunodeficiency, but if they're, if they're abnormal, that just heightens the need to see someone earlier. And then the GP can pick up the phone and talk to their friendly you know, immunologist and get help. And if this person issues need to be escalated, then we can see people earlier. So I squeeze people in all the time, as do my colleagues who actually need to be seen earlier. Now, coming back to your next question. So that's, that's the first thing. Go and see a GP. Make sure they know that you're worried about the fact that you've got ongoing infections or, or lots of other symptoms that don't seem right. The next, the, the next level is what you can do to... Um, to optimize your health. And, and some of that includes what you're alluding to, actually general lifestyle things, don't smoke. Smoking in fact is, so actually I'm going to come back before I say that. Primary immunodeficiencies, so things that potentially have a genetic cause, et cetera, um, are not as common as what we call secondary immunodeficiencies. So people who um, are aging, medications, including medications that suppress the immune system, um, cancers, etc., cetera, um, diabetes, bad, malnutrition, dietary things are the major causes of our immune system not to work quite as well. And that includes getting more infections, inflammatory elements, allergies, etc. And then on top of that, Things like obesity, obesity itself is a pro-inflammatory state. Um, and so losing some weight and exercise is actually a really important um, contribution to overall reduction in, in inflammation. Um, smoking is another pro-inflammatory um, state. And so reactive, oxy uh, reactive um, oxygen species, et cetera, uh, injury, direct injury to the lungs, to the upper airways, or, or and heart increasing, increasing all those bad aspects. If you stop smoking, can actually also reduce problems and smoking increases your chance of actually getting infection in the lung in itself. So they've done studies where they've looked at children who um, are in households where there's smoking within the house, 
and or within the cars that they travel in. And those children definitely have an increased risk or an increased incidence of both viral and bacterial infections. And, and what about stress? Stress is definitely also uh, an immune, um, an immunized suppressant or in, in the sense that you may have heard of athletes who've been training, so actually the stress and also over-exercise, but um, if you, there have been studies in, ath in athletes who have been under stress and both mental, mental as, a, as, a, as well as physical strength, stress, and they've shown that there have been changes in their, their immune responses, so the function of the immune system that varies with how much stress they're under, for example, big races and big events, et cetera. So um, it is important also to moderate the amount of stress. That's easier said than done, obviously. So Dr. Wong, you've shared with us some really fantastic information um, about what can be done as an adult um, or even for our children while we're waiting to see uh, an immunologist or an allergist. Uh, and I found that information really insightful and I think we do forget that we can go to our GPs and your your timely reminder that you know um, there is a very simple blood test that can be ordered um, that can screen for um, you know uh, immunology events and allergies and that in the event that there is a more serious and immediate risk um, a GP can coordinate a speedier uh, interaction with an uh, immunologist or allergist. But then you also um, shared with us some great lifestyle changes that will uh, impact and reduce the severity of inflammation, which is, you know, the, the reason that we would have such strong reactions to an allergy or an underlying immunology uh, issue. And that was, you know, diet and exercise, uh, reduction of stress, um, not smoking. Um, are there any other environmental things that could be modified um, to reduce inflammation and to help um, the immune system? So I, we come back to diet as well. So many of the things we eat are either good for us or bad for us. And so again, the, making sure we have a balanced normal normal diet, which includes the, you know, the, the vitamins and minerals that are important as well. Um, vitamin C, zinc, selenium, that sort of stuff is really important. And I'm not saying to go overboard and I'm not saying that you have to go out and, and buy lots and lots of multivitamins, um, but, but having a balanced diet really helps. There, there is more and more evidence that probiotics of certain types can actually help our overall all, um, immune defences and immune regulation as well. And I also come back to children and making sure that we remember that breastfeeding in the first few months of life is actually really important to help protect against infection, but also help to moderate our, our immune systems. Reducing the instance of allergy, for example, um, is, is definitely something that breastfeeding in the first few months of life it, it has been shown to do. So in terms of, um, you know, in the context of ageing well and, uh, you know, uh, improving our lifespan and health span, um, this area of health is something that we really shouldn't be neglecting. It, you know, it's not just uh, a post-pandemic level of interest that we should have in our immune systems, in the reduction of inflammation. This should be a conversation and a priority as part of you know, addressing um, cellular wellness and aging well and living well. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and we forget that there are many things that are not dependent on medications that we can actually do to ensure that we have, uh, have healthy lives, long healthy lives if we can. Well, I want to thank you again so much for sharing that insight and, uh, you know, and for raising awareness that Australia is a little bit behind in offering that test for the skid and um and and i'm sure that you know just by raising the awareness it, it is something that um you know parents uh, of newborns or soon to be parents uh, they can ask for it is there anything that you can do to expedite this being added to the list of routine testing and in fact the this is actually being assessed at the moment so we have put in um, as a community applications to the government to add this funding 
to and and you might you may well have seen some of the the information that's out there so this test will cost about ten dollars per infant which is when we talk about screening a significant amount of money so obviously needs to be assessed to make sure that it is cost effective for our community and it's not wasted money but we certainly have lots of evidence to show that it is cost effective because any of these children who have skid actually when they get very sick can actually cost our health system a lot more money than the amount of money that would be spent screening. And so this is has been and hopefully will be an assessed and, and a, um, a decision made, which what might help us then have the funding available in, in Australia. And, and the, the important thing there is each state actually is responsible for their own newborn screening programs. And so it is a state by state decision. And the more support we have within states to for government to do this is, is actually really important. And you may have heard very recently that um, there have been a number of programs that for genetic testing in, in, in children, as well as adults being, being approved for funding. And part of this program hopefully will allow this, this to be introduced as well. And I'm just going to get you to remind us once again, what is the blood screening test that we can ask our GP for? Okay, so what I was talking about was particularly from the point of view of people with recurrent infections. Yes. Um, and so a full blood count, because counting some of the white blood cells and also looking at particular characteristics of, of some of the white blood cells, plate, the platelets and the red cells can actually help. Um, point us in, in directions for diagnosis and the antibody levels. So IgG, IgA and IgM. And then on top of that, the GP can actually add other tests that may be particularly useful. That includes screening for celiac disease, screening for um, signs of inflammation, which in, so there are blood tests to do that. Looking, for example, for diabetes in, in older people and um, and tests for allergies specifically can be actually done doing using a blood test, but best to also not, again, not do a blanket of tests for things that people might be allergic to, but particularly checking on what things might actually be, be um, exposed by asking you know, if you eat certain foods, what happens, and then asking specifically about that food in, in in testing so that was just an example of some tests that can be and done and what about gut microbiome because you talked about probiotics and um, gut health being a, you know a key factor to being able to be resilient towards inflammation and uh, and allergies um, is that something that we can also request at a gp level no so so the study is looking at um the 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 microbiome of the, the of of individual stools are actually specialized tests and they're not routinely available um, and again it's a bit like genetic testing you you really have to it's not as clear cut as you would like to to imagine and so in many respects what I would say is be pragmatic about it we know that ex excessive antibiotics will actually change the gut flora. Um, you've mentioned stress, et cetera, stuff like that can, can actually make a difference to the, the profile of our flora. Uh, things like smoking, things like breastfeeding uh, have their uh, obviously affects, affects um, what's in the gut. And, and so it is important that we, we actually nurture, oh, and, and, and diet, of course, diet is, is really important as well. So it is important to, to nurture the right sort of gut environment because what happens in the gut interestingly actually um, ends up affecting the way the immune system works in in other parts of the body and so they so one of the things that you may have heard of is is fecal transplants yes and you know, it's, it's actually been proven in again that's for ibs in, they're using it for is that correct Exactly. So irritable bowel syndrome, people who have ongoing infections in the bowel that can't be gotten rid of. And we also know, for example, that you can, depending on where the store comes from, transfer obesity, or, uh, for example, from some one person to another and other aspects where the immune system um, is, is being affected. So we do have to be a little bit careful what we're doing and think about those consequences as well. But it, it is 
an indication of how gut health is really important to be considering. Wow. Again, I'm so grateful for this conversation because I think it, it goes to, you know, understanding the pillars of good health, understanding the pillars of cellular wellness. And as you said, rightly so, it's it's not about just, you know, doing one or two odd things like taking your vitamins or fixing up your diet or reducing stress. There, there are fundamental pillars of cellular wellness, longevity, lifespan, health span that and immunology and understanding and protecting and enhancing your immune system is a really key conversation when we are talking about an ageless life, a better life. I'm going to add one more thing, and that is when your immune system is is unstable and overactive, either because it's too much allergy, too much inflammation, autoimmunity, too, too many infections, it's working overtime. And it may not be actually working at its best. So it's just revving itself up. And tiredness is one of the biggest symptoms many people report when their immune system is not working properly. And, and so if you can think about it as wasted energy or that energy that should be going to your thinking, to going to exercise, et cetera, is actually feeding an immune system that can't quite control itself. And so we need to be thinking about that as well. Thank you so much. It was just an absolute pleasure to speak to you. And um, I'm delighted to have hosted you on the show. Thank you again for being on it. It's my pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please share and rate this episode. I'd love that.